Because everybody remembers that didn't work, and they remember the source of the uh, en encouragement, me. And uh, <coughs> who was it? Was it, uh, it was Piatz. Was it Piatz that had the card, football card? So uh, there was an event where, at Moonbrook, I remember at Moonbrook, oh, I'm not sure. sure why I was there, but I was one of the MCs. Uh -huh. And I was probably making fun of myself, but uh, if I had a football card of Al B. Miller, <coughs> and I framed it, uh -huh. and I gave it to somebody, and everybody got a good laugh at my expense. Uh, sure. Well, it turns out, when we interviewed Piazza, he had a brown bag. And he just came in with a brown bag. And oh. at the very end, he goes, Greg, I want to show you something. I'm not going to give to you, but I'm going to show you something. He pulls it out. It's the Al B. Miller card. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> what I gave to him, apparently. Oh. Maybe it was when he retired. Maybe that was it. Maybe uh, his retirement thing. Or I hadn't heard about that one. Oh, jeez. Oh, so right around, on camera, he, they, uh, he got me good. And Becky did, too. Mm -hmm. you know, Becky Bromogen, because yeah, he's right, right, right. Greg. You're the guy, man. You're the guy. And then we had to, who was it that had to fire him? Piatz, probably. You know, somebody, when he finally decided to get rid of him, uh -huh. somebody had to, the job of getting rid of him. Uh -huh. And it must have been Piatz. It was Piatz who right. talked with them. To, yeah, yeah. It, and I never understood it because it should have been to me. I hired him. Somebody. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt fine with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You did your job. Yeah, great. Yeah, right, make, right. Make, make everybody happy, including Greg. Uh, we got it. We got him, and then somebody had to get rid of him. So it was Bruce. <laughs> That's why he probably got the card. You know, makes sense. But now it makes all sense in the world. Oh. We're rolling. Okay, this is fantastic. Well, uh, Joe DiCarlo, this is this is great. Thank you for for coming. And you're so well known in your just your social s services world. Um, but did that come natural, Joe? Was that something that your family, were they involved in such things? Not really. My father came from Sicily when he was 15 years old. Okay. And uh, he started out as a tailor in Buffalo. Uh, and then he went to Rochester. He was only 16. And then he somehow got connected to a shoe repair shop. In, uh, I think it was in Buffalo. And he eventually opened up his own shoe shop. Ah. So that was his career for many, many years. And uh, I was very little during World War II as a kid, but I remember him being away most of the time because he worked for Colonial Radio after he finished his 10-hour shift in his shop. He would walk to the factory, and uh, we'd see him on weekends <laughs> during the war. Uh, but uh, And my mother was not employed at all. She was a, uh, a very outgoing person, though, who wanted to help everybody yeah. in the neighborhood, one of those individuals. And she was, she was dead set on me becoming a physician, a doctor. Mm -hmm. My son is going to become a doctor. Well, as you know, I became a doctor, but not the kind of doctor that my mother <laughs> wanted. <laughs> so when I got my PhD, she had died at age 54, and I, I got the, the doctorate after she died. So occasionally when I told people that story, I say, now I walk in the middle of my living room and I say, hey, mom, I'm a doctor. Yeah. Not the kind you wanted. <laughs> so so where, what neighborhood did, did you grow up the, in Buffalo? The Riverside section Riverside. of Buffalo, yeah, yeah. Right along the Niagara River. Yep. And did you go to high school there? Did you graduate yeah, high school? Yeah, Riverside High School. And my kids are still, my kids are both uh, well adults. They uh, still are in belief that I could look out of my second story classroom in Riverside and see Canada. Because uh, the, the school was about three blocks from the Niagara River and Fort Erie was right across, which is about a mile and a half. Yeah. And they said, you couldn't see Canada from the United States. And, well, I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I spent the first 18 years of my life, 19 years of my life there. Took a couple buses to get to the University of Buffalo and Things went from there. So uh, you graduated from River Riverside High School, and then you went to UB. UB, yeah, for a long time. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Uh, what when were you born, Joe? I'm sorry. What year were you born? Uh, Thirty-seven. So you were born in 1937, uh, and I, you've been four years old. But do you have do you have any 
memory at all of, of, of the war time? Yeah, yeah. Um, my Uncle Sammy, who was my godfather, was my favorite person in the world. <coughs> and he, he was killed in Germany crossing the Rhine. Mm. And a few weeks later, Germany had uh, surrendered, so we, we missed him that way. So that was, I remember that vividly. I remember when he uh, enrolled, because he, he had lost a finger in an industrial amputation working for Curtis Wright, the aircraft manufacturers. And, uh, and it was his trigger finger. I still recall one day he came home to my mother, who was, I think, the original pacifist. She was really, <laughs> he walked in, and my mother was the head of, uh, the oldest of seven kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sammy was like the fourth, I think. So he walked into our kitchen, I can still see it, 1943 or 44, and uh, he said, Lucy, I just joined the army. And my mother blew up. She started calling him every name you could think of. <laughs> and, and I was, I don't know how old I was, four or five or whatever, but I remember being terrified. <laughs> yeah. But he, he went in and uh, about a year later he was killed. So, uh, do you remember when they, when the, how the word got back to the family and, and the, kind of the, that reaction? At some point, there must have been very emotional. In terms of my reaction was, I, I thought that was great. You know, my, my two uncles, one joined the Navy. My two uncles are going to be in, in a war against right, those right. terrible people. So, yeah, from a kid's point of view, uh, I was happy. But I didn't know, of course, until my, my uncle was, was killed, that uh, it was not that great after all. The, what, what did your do you remember your mother's reaction when the, when the word came out that her brother had died? <coughs> she was very upset. I recall one time when she, uh, and it was just about a year after the war. Oh, when, no, it was before the war ended that I think President Roosevelt died. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I remember her uh, uh, talking to a neighbor, and the neighbor had just heard that President Roosevelt died, and she said, Lucy, did you hear President Roosevelt died? And my mother used an expletive to say, I don't, that he died, my brother. You know, and so she was quite adamant about that. Yeah. And, uh, and I was surprised, of course. I didn't know really the whole story sure. behind everything. But, but I remember those moments very well. Now, you would have been, let's see, uh, having been born in 1937, <laughs> about you'd been nine years old when the uh, when the war ended, VJ Day in 1946. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Riverside in that area? Was there a celebration? All I, all I remember is a uh, newspaper kid across the street from my house, which was, again, right in the middle of the city in Riverside. I remember him holding up his papers, screaming somebody, you know, the, the victory in Europe, whatever. I recall that vividly. And I, that's about it. I don't remember anything else about it, except still feeling very anti-Germany and anti-Japan, as if, as if both countries were populated by people who were terrible people. That, of course, dissipated not long after that. But uh, yeah, it was a strong feeling for, for probably most kids, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I had crazy fantasies about going over there and doing some damage to the country. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, you want some water? Pardon me? You want some water? I'm okay right now. This okay. is going to continue, okay. I'm afraid. Okay, that's all fine. Um, so you go from there to University of Buffalo. Did you know what you wanted to study there? Well, essentially, it was, I really had no choice. It felt like that anyway. I had to become a, an MD. So I enrolled in the, uh, what was it called? Oh. Uh, so it, was, it was a science major, basically. You needed so many credits in science to, to be accepted in the medical school. Mm -hmm. So my, my, as it turned out, my minor was science, but in my sophomore, late sophomore year, I chose, I took a course in psychology, and that this is where I really belong. So I, took, I wound up majoring in psychology and minoring in science, and there I went to graduate school, became a rehab counselor. <laughs> for my master's degree. Was, did you feel comfortable in that? I mean, did you find, feel like that was your niche? I really did. Uh, with the bachelor's degree, I 
still felt kind of lost. I didn't really quite know. I did apply to, uh, to, a couple, to one medical school. Uh, and they put me on the waiting list for the following year, and I didn't want to wait. So I was offered a federal grant to uh, go to uh, get my master's degree in rehabilitation counseling and couldn't turn that down, so I did it and for two years, did that, and then went out and worked as a counselor. Eventually came back to UB. They wanted me to be a clinical supervisor. So I worked in that department, the graduate school, first couple of years, and uh, they encouraged me to go on for my PhD, and, and it was less than encouragement. It was, uh, come on, you need to get your... So I went on for it and got it. It was kind of fortunate that way. You, I'm reading this, uh, you served as director of the Western New York Regional Education Center, New York State Department of Mental Hygiene, and an associate director for program administration and development with the Mental Health Manpower and Training in Buffalo. Hmm. And <coughs> it also says you were a certified rehabilitation counselor and served on numerous boards and committees in Western New York relating to mental health, disability, and social issues which sort of puts you in a niche, I mean, uh, as far as the mental health yeah. area. Uh, again, was that, was, was that gravitational? The, yeah, you know? it really was. I was. After I got my PhD, I was hired um, as a supervising psychologist for Gowanda Psychiatric Center. Wow. And those were the days when the institutions were thriving in a sense of tremendous populations living. Mm -hmm. Gowanda, I think, had about 2,000 uh, patients at the time. Yep. Uh, and from there, I got recruited to open up this regional education center. There were four or five in New York State. <laughs> and then they went well. They were funded by the Departmental Hygiene until I think it was 1975. There was a tremendous budget crunch. And Governor Hugh Carey mm -hmm. was governor. And uh, it was a terrible time financially for the state. And they defunded all five regional education centers. So I lost, of course, lost my job and uh, looked around for other positions. <coughs> and finally, I found the Resource Center. It was called, I think it was called the Achievement Center at the time. Yeah. Uh, that was 1977. So you saw the, the, an, an ad or perhaps a posting someplace about Resource Center. And you, so you, were you living in Gowanda? No, I, in, well, actually, I was living in Hamburg at the time, okay. right outside of Buffalo. So you were commuting? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and so this opportunity presented itself in 1977, and the executive director at the time was? was Michael Raymond. Michael Raymond. Yeah, so and I heard about the position from a close friend of mine who worked for the New York State Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Uh, and we, we, Dave and I had gone to school together, eventually was my best man. But uh, Dave had a territory that he covered. He was based in the city of Buffalo, but he had a part of the southern tier where he was kind mm. of a contact consultant. And he said, Joel, he says, I was in Jamestown, New York, uh, last week, and I had visited this sheltered workshop. Not a very big one, but uh, I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I said, oh, his name is Michael Raymond. And he said, I don't know a lot about him, but what I've seen and what I've heard, I think he's a real hustler. He's going to really, I believe, expand that organization just by sense and feel about him. He was excited and committed and, you know, he said, uh, you might want to go and visit, look the place over. So I did. And uh, that's how it happened. And he offered me a job and uh, I took it. So what was your impression? You walk in and, and he was bewhiskered. I assume he had a beard at the time. Uh, I think he did. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. But he was, it was a surprise in a way because uh, he was an executive director and he was walking around on, with jeans <laughs> and uh, sneakers and a checkered shirt, a lumberjack shirt, and he was excited showing me all over the place. <laughs> and I was impressed with that, but still kind of surprised. I didn't have a sense of this place being organized. And uh, <laughs> I found out it really wasn't that well organized. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, at the time too, they had the Dunkirk Achievement Center and the Westfield Achievement Center. Uh, and so he had uh, a very busy, he was a very busy guy, very successful. Uh, and at that time, the center, the achievement center had only one group home, and that was in the city. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that was a 
major achievement and a breakthrough for the organization. Uh, but yeah, it was a, I, I had come from, I mean, my background was with organizations that were kind of structurally organized in a fairly traditional way, you know, and uh, it just didn't feel, it felt kind of odd and foreign to me in a way. But uh, I'm so happy it turned out well for me and my wife. Uh, so the, the group home was, uh is that the one here on Fair, uh, right here in, J in downtown Jamestown? Yeah, Fairmount, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a very old yeah, yeah. home. Yeah, I think, I think it was because it was an old home and one of the originals, there were more people living there than there would be if, as we developed newer homes where we had a capacity of five or six people. But I think there are 10, I'm not sure of that. I think there are 10 people living in Fairmount. Yeah, I know that, that home's been around forever because it was there in 1977 as the first kind of, it was a breakthrough kind of thing, not just for the resource center, but for the state. Yeah. <coughs> the state was really, that was just the beginning of the whole, what was known as deinstitutionalization. It's the Willowbrook time. Decree. That was, yep, yep, Willowbrook Decree, yeah. That kind of kicked everything off. Yeah. My, my, my particular involvement, because I came in about the same time you did, Joe, and <coughs> I remember. That group, what do you remember? I remember you started, you took Sherry's place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sherry, yeah, Sherry Cat, perfect, yeah. Joe. Uh, Sherry, simply, I was a new kid in the, in the office, and Sherry said, I can't keep up with this crazy <laughs> Mike Raymond. You, you, you get involved. So next thing you know, I'm on the board. Next thing you know, I'm, oh, yeah. a lot of things happen. Uh, but the group home, I think this is the group home that had a mortgage. We released it. We released it. We didn't own it at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the landlord had a mortgage with Northwest. Oh, okay. And they were foreclosing. And that was a problem. That was a crisis. That was my first big crisis. And Mike said, figure it out. <coughs> so we figured out that we'd go to Northwest and they would foreclose. But we created something called Chautauqua Rehabilitation Facilities Corp. Yes, I remember that now, yeah. And that we, it was a for-profit. Mm -hmm. And we would uh, uh, buy it from the bank, the bank would foreclose, buy it from the bank, so nobody could, nobody had to leave. <coughs> and then we would simply lease it to the resource center. Ah, okay. And everything would remain the same. Ah. And that became a model of a lot of landlords somehow not paying uh -huh. their mortgages. And so that was the beginning of Chautauqua Rehab, uh, mm. out of crisis, yeah, total yeah. crisis. Huh. And the bank Northwest, to their credit, uh, was very accommodating to give us a mortgage which was yeah. paid off by the lease. Yeah. Um, that's why we were able to stay in a few of these early group homes. Oh, that, wow. Yeah. T totally unaware of that. Yeah, well, um, we didn't want anybody to really know <laughs> doing that kind of magic. Um, at the time, was Kay there? Was Kay, was Kay the uh, executive? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, she was there well before me. Yeah. Uh, I could see she and Mike had a very good working relationship. Uh, I think it was good, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it was. I mean, Kay really admired Michael in many ways, and it was vice versa too. Yeah. As, as frustrated as she would become in so many ways, uh, people showing up on a Monday morning, <laughs> telling her that she was they were hired over the weekend by Michael Raymond. <laughs> we used to call him. What do they call them? Saturday, Saturday night specials. Mm. They would they would report on Monday morning. <laughs> I remember, and uh, <laughs> but you you between Kay, Kay of course she was the gatekeeper. I was I'm sorry. Kay, Kay was the gatekeeper. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so they had to come to Kay first, yeah. and then but you were doing the hiring and a lot of that stuff. Yes, did you was, then get it? Then, then did they ask you to get involved? Oh yeah, uh, I got uh, quite involved quite a right away. Right, right. One of the things that I had that in a way shocked me, I guess is the word, when I was hired and getting acquainted, Mike was you know, talking more about responsibilities and so on, and he told me I'd be responsible for, it was a director of rehabilitation services, that was the title he created, that I'd be responsible for the rehab services, <coughs> including the diagnostic vocational evaluation unit, which is where everybody went when they entered the program, it was a place where they started. And uh, he said that, uh, woman, you'll be overseeing that. And uh, I said, well, who supervised that? He said, he stopped a little bit. He said, well, her name is, Mike, uh, her name is Nancy Raymond. I said, well, your, your last name is Raymond, too. 
I said, well, Nancy's my wife. <laughs> You're asking me to supervise the boss's wife? <laughs> As it turned out, the happy ending was that Nancy and I, were, we, we worked very well. And I, I viewed it as a collegial relationship, not a supervisor. So yeah. And it worked out beautifully because of her and me, I guess. But the, it, it was a shock at first. <laughs> well, given your role and uh, the question of the Saturday night specials, uh, we recently interviewed Marie Karuba. Yeah. And she's had a story with you, too. So you want to share that? I think I know. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you know that Marie is uh, the first and only executive director of the Southwestern Independent Living Center. And how that came about, the uh, New York State Division of Vocational Rehabilitation had issued a request for proposals to establish independent living centers and locations across the state. The whole idea was to establish a program that was totally disconnected from any service organizations that could be in a better position to advocate for people with disabilities. And uh, I wrote a proposal and uh, we were awarded the grant. Uh, now, Cattaraugus and Allegheny also, because it was supposed to cover three county area, but mine was accepted. and. Uh, so I, we accepted the grant, I think it was about 75,000, maybe 50. And that, that was 1982 or three, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. <laughs> so I interviewed, of course. No, I, yeah, I interviewed one or two people, but Mike wanted to do all the interviewing, because he liked the idea of the Independent Living Center. Even though we were, we, we were required to spin it off into its own uh, entity, its own 501c3, to cr actually make it independent of the resource center. Uh, so with that term that I had to follow, we still accepted the grant, of course. <coughs> and Mike decided to interview. So <laughs> I didn't know who he was interviewing. He, did, he wanted to do it. I was, okay, Mike. And uh, one morning, it was probably about 9, nine o'clock in the morning, course, I walked out of my office and I saw this person, kind of, you know, a young woman, kind of walking around. She looked bewildered. And I had never, I didn't know who she was. And so I asked, can I help you? You seem kind of bewildered here. And she told me. Uh, and she told, I said, well, what was the interview about? You know, what were you hired to do? And she thought, I believe she thought initially she was hired to be the attorney, an attorney, or the attorney. I'm not sure, because I didn't talk with Mike about it, uh, for the resource center, or the achievement center at the time. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, why don't you come with me to my office? <laughs> so we sat down and I told her all about the grant and it, it's, in, its intent, what it was for. And uh, Marie at, the point, at that point had no background at all, educationally or service-wise in rehabilitation. Um, but she appeared quite interested, had some really great questions, as only Marie could do. And uh, <laughs> she said, uh, well, thank you very much, and we concluded the little discussion. Then I found out later that she had gone home. <coughs> she was from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. She had gone home at that time to, to really think deeply about it because she just, it was really very foreign concept to her professionally. <coughs> and she said she came, told me later, that she came extremely close to turning the job down, to basically having to, to to quit. Yeah. But uh, thank goodness she decided to accept it and moved on from there. And she worked, uh, well, yeah, at, the point, at that point, of course, they were part of the resource center and I was the, I oversaw things, of course, and Marie got off to a really good start. She, and she's still there, the first and only executive director of the yeah. Southwestern Independent Living Center and terrific, as you know. Mm -hmm. so. Now she, she just thought that was kind of fun and she felt like and, and only in hindsight that she was being uh, interviewed as maybe being one of those Saturday night specials. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Never heard that. Yeah, yeah. She kind of <laughs> didn't, I think she, she said, uh, Joe, I'm not sure what uh, Joe thought of me, what I was, but uh, that maybe I was one of them. <laughs> uh, turned out not the case. So as you started off, do you get a sense of the resource center's reputation in the community. You know, 1977, you come in from Buffalo, 
Mike Brayman, uh, was, uh, Becky was there at the time? No, she was hired after me. So, I mean, it's relatively new stuff. Sure. And, uh, yes, yeah, somewhat disorganized, as I recall, too. Mm -hmm. uh, in the community, did you get a sense of what the reaction was of, <coughs> of the Resource Center? Uh, not really, because I really didn't know the community. I was not really connected in really any way okay. to uh, people in the community. I mean, later on, I got very involved. But no, I really didn't get a sense of that other than people that knew my, or had heard about Michael Raymond clearly felt that he was a real character. I never heard anything really bad about him, you know, or, you know, but uh, they recognized him. Who those people who knew him? And I'm sure yeah. you knew that too. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but that was pretty much it. There was some indication that I got, because you know, I, heard, I heard about this group home, and uh, I, I think people were getting, already getting concerned about that becoming a, a situation where they're going to be dealing with group homes, with people with adults with serious disabilities mm -hmm. living in their neighborhoods. So that, I got a sense of that beginning to boil a little bit, mm -hmm. and sure enough, as you know, we did have some issues, but things worked out beautifully. With communities, I can't think of a one where the original idea of uh, placing a group home in the community, I can't think of any really off the top of my head who objected a great deal, uh, although some had, and I attended a number of meetings that were not required, but I think it was a good idea was Michael's to meet with <coughs> community reps before we actually began identifying locations, so on. And I can remember a couple of them where it was, they were, there was a, extreme negativity uh, to the point where I remember one person from the community, I won't mention the group home in the community, but uh, she got up and she was convinced that our folks were gonna get in their cars and run all over their front lawns and some of them would you know, go behind their homes and look in the windows and, you know, those kind of really stereotypical ideas. So uh, I think Mark Morton was with me on mm -hmm. that one. Anyway, we were successful in allaying her fears and so on. But uh, so I think I was beginning to sense some of that mm -hmm. when I first started. But, uh, and of course, Mike was pr pretty well known at the time, I guess. He mm -hmm. hadn't lived there in the community very long when I started, but... I just don't recall how long he was there. But uh, we've been very, very fortunate over the years. As, you know, we have many, many uh, residences in all, virtually every location I can think of in Chautauqua County. And uh, so there's been a great community welcoming in many ways <clears throat> of our places. Yeah, my perspective, perception is that it's gone about 180 degrees since the old oh, days where absolutely. there was the washed and unwashed sort of aspect Absolutely. of it to uh and and thank god for uh those outreach programs which were hostile and then i got involved of course with the hearings themselves with the padovan bill oh, and, that's right, and, yeah. and all of that and uh, <coughs> excuse and, me and ultimately we knew we were going to win if we mm -hmm. hit certain punch boxes but you didn't want to come in and with a sledgehammer mm -hmm. uh, and so it was a, a lot of strategy, strategic planning, which involved a lot of people, including yourself and Mark and, and, and Marie, you name it. It was a whole yeah, lot of stuff yeah. going on. Uh, but yeah, nowadays, you don't hear one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they're, they're embraced. <laughs> uh, you think about that particular aspect of it. Um, you, did you did you attend board meetings? Did you come to the board meetings? No, like I never did. Never yeah. did. No, I, I didn't get. To, I know you were on the board. I didn't get to know you at all. John Real was on the board at the same time, and I got to know John, but not in a professional way. It was he would drop into my office and we talk yeah. about a whole bunch. Of, and he was funny. I mean, I remember sitting there laughing almost at some of his. He never told jokes. He was just very, very funny. He'd come up with comments. So I only knew him in that kind of relationship. But I had heard that he was an excellent board member. Fantastic. I'm delighted you brought up his name because I'm not sure he's been brought up other than by me. Uh, tell me a little bit more about John Real. I mean, just uh, give us give a little more background for the camera. All I knew is that he was a, a, a businessman with a, with a very strong business background. <laughs> and he was very, very 
constructive in terms of uh, developing our, our group homes, our residential facilities, uh, and that I, on a personal level, I really enjoyed them. But uh, I just knew he had a, an excellent reputation, and, and Mike felt very strongly about John, that he really, and, and I think, and John, didn't John own our building, or was a developer? I, I just can't recall, there was some connection to the building that we were part of on Jones and Gifford, I, I just yeah. recall. Yeah. Part of the automatic voting machine company, all those buildings, all right. and it then became Walter Heller. Ah, okay. And Walter Heller uh, was in that part of the Cummins yeah. facility. That was all part of that because they were going to go from here to Cummins, and then that didn't happen. Oh, okay. You know, the, uh, uh, well, and so <coughs> John was hired by Walter Heller to deal with the properties. Ah, all right. And so John's office was right there, you know, in, in the Jones and Gifford facility. Yeah. And John was on the board with me. He was sort of, and John enjoyed uh, taking Mike on as sort of a father figure ah. and helping him through that. And mm -hmm. what I remember the most about John's Irish wit, and he and I were the only two non um, blood related, blood relations with a developmentally disabled. You know, you had, there was a certain percentage that had to be on the board who were family members. Right. And, I was the young kid, and then John was the property guy. So we were the two guys on the board that had no such connections. Connection, yeah. Uh, and that was okay, but uh, that, that was our, that distinguished us mm -hmm. a little bit. And we had to be very mindful and conscious because we were sort of the corporate governance. Hey, we got to act like real businesses, and that be a family thing. But yeah. at the same time, be sensitive mm -hmm. to most all the board members had to worry about their children and True. hitting the buses and the Absolutely. meals and. <laughs> and, and not say, let <clears> me <throat> uh, make sure that we get it, some balance. Anyways, uh, John, the brilliance. Remember, we had three floors at Jones and Gifford. Mm -hmm. Somehow, we were able to buy with an option to purchase a floor at a time. John and I would create these, cobble up these agreements, still have them, <laughs> you know, first floor. Basically buying, it's, it was a condominium concept. Huh. I didn't know if it was very legal, but we just paid off the first floor, yeah. then the second floor, then the third floor, until finally we owned the building. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, it was, you know, just a great, John wanted a way to feel like we started to have a stake in the building. Oh, dear. And it was a way for him to get rid of it, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we felt pride, proud in mm -hmm. not just being a tenant. So that was the beginning, and it was John. Good building, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, 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 Unfortunately, his real contribution was guiding Mike because Mike had conceptual ideas. And uh -huh. of course, when it came to social services, he was like no other, but we still got the bricks and mortar deal. Sure, got to yeah. deal with this. And that was John. Uh, so I'm glad you brought up his name. Uh, 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 just for the camera, what the heck? It's a great story. When John died, I was one of a few people who were uh, asked to be a pallbearer. Mm -hmm. Sherry Cadwell and I. Oh, yes. Sure. So we're in the front row at St. James <laughs> Church. <coughs> and what I remember so distinctly about the funeral was the pastor whose name, or the father, uh, whose name I forget, um, but when they did the, did the, the incense, you know, oh, around, right. sure, sure. they must have put more incense in than, than, than the Pope. You know, and it just <laughs> wafted up so that we or everybody was choking and smoking. It was like a big... John would have loved that. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I'll never forget John's Reels funeral. And then, of course, then we had to be the casket bearer and the smoke was... Or the incense was still there. It got nothing to do at all with the research there. Um, so here you are, Joe. This is the beginning, and, and now you're, you're sort of responsible for building an infrastructure with Mike. I mean, you're hiring people, and you're close to Mike. Yeah. And you kind of see how his brain is working, and working with Albany, and you're probably working oh, yeah. with Albany. Yeah. And how, do, how would you describe that sort of 70s, 80s? Well, one of, one of the things that I think made him probably unique, and he took some risks doing this. He, did not want to work with local representatives. He didn't really use those words, but that's basically how he worked. He wanted to work directly with Albany. Right. 
And that's what he did. He'd fly to Albany. And, and of course, he respected the local reps. But uh, when he wanted to do something, especially if it was innovative, he'd, he'd talk to the people directly in Albany who were re had the full responsibility mm -hmm. of approving and funding on all the risks. And he was absolutely great at that. Because he, in my impression, he got the results almost all the time. Uh, and that was, again, uh, connected to his personality as well. <coughs> I mean, he ran the organization, too. That was clear. You, it was really Michael, or Michael Raymond's place. He was not like, you know, he's an executive director, but you know, they kind of come and go. Kind of no, that was Michael Raymond's place. And, uh, and it, he demonstrated it very well, I think. In the 10 years I worked with him, you know, but, uh, and of course his personal life was something else too, you know. He became sort of, not everyone in the community, but he, people in the community recognized him as a guy who had a life beyond work. Uh, he made an impression in the community, sometimes in negative ways. Uh, but, because uh, he, was, he was out a lot. He never missed a day of work. Yeah. I mean, he was always there. And I didn't see him go to lunch much at all. I think he, <coughs> I think he worked through most of his lunch hours. So he never had, as far as I could see, uh, propensity to go out to lunch, have a few drinks, you know, come back. Uh, he did his partying at night, never during the day. We never had Christmas parties with, with booze. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that was his style, and it was very, very successful in terms of the mission of the organization. I don't think, we would, we would I keep saying we, but you know, because I've been mean. out of there for 14, 15 years. But uh, in fact, my wife always had, Joe, why do you say we when people ask you about the research? Uh, so I have to tell her, you know, 28 years. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, I don't think the Resource Center would, would be where it is today without, without Michael and his, uh, his I mean, he, in many ways he hired the right people too. And I'm not talking about me so much, but, <laughs> and when I got there, he had some you know, pretty, pretty good staff already on board. Uh, you know, Bruce was the first residential director, I believe, and uh, he had a, he did a really nice job in kicking it off and the thing. So it, it went from there. But you know, I was going to say Mike was instrumental in its growth, but it was more than that. You know, certainly. Yeah. And then of course the achievement center, the name he wanted to change the name. We were the the, the uh, actual name, the business name, as you would probably recall was the Chautauqua County chapter mm -hmm. of the New York State Association for Retarded Children, NYSERC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and every one of the 60 counties, I think it is in New York State, had a chapter of the mm -hmm. New York State Association of Retarded Children. And uh, Mike wanted to change that to a more generic, more appropriate, and in some ways, appropriate to the mission uh, name. And uh, I think we went from Achievement Center to Oh, what was it? Chautauqua County Resource Center. Mm -hmm. And then he and others, including me, felt, well, that almost, and it, and it did, I talked to people in the community, thought that we were an agency, mm -hmm. a department or whatever, an agency of the county, of county government, which we were not. So then he changed it to the Resource Center after that. So and that's where we wound up with the, the title. Uh, but yeah, we got, we got a lot done. Uh, you know, the Southwestern Independence Center, Living Center was one of the really, from my point of view, uh, kind of a, a, kind of many, in many ways a great achievement. Uh, then of course the Recreation Department grew measurably. I wrote a federal grant for that one. That Did you? A, <coughs> I think it was a request for proposals. And it was national. It came from Washington. And so the proposals were open to any rehabilitation organization in the nation, but they pointed out that they didn't. They were only able to fund 20 in the in the in the country. And Michael got the RFPs. He always got them. The reprint for proposals. And so he usually came to my office and put them on my desk. <laughs> and he said, "Here, Joe, take care of this. Look at it." Well, it turned out this was called. The proposal was for recreation services for people with disabilities. And I said, Michael, what are you giving me this for? I have no academic background at all. 
I mean, recreation specialists receive their degrees or graduate degrees in this field. I said, I have no background in it other than knowing about them. Uh, he said, ah, give it a try. So I wrote it, and uh, I didn't know how to start. Even. So I thought, well, we're trying to normalize people in the community. So what do people do in Chautauqua County for fun? So I started listing, you know, the lake and the boating, the fishing, downhill skiing, cross-country skiing, all the rest. So I said, okay. So I wrote it with that in mind in terms of what opportunities were available to our folks. And, uh, of course, I wrote in requests for uh, skis, cross-country skis, downhill. I requested a van for rec to use for people transporting folks. Uh, I also requested a boat <laughs> to of course, for people to use the boat as for fishing or leisurely boating or whatever. And I asked for a pontoon boat, figuring that would be really neat, very accessible, flat, probably get a wheelchair on fairly easily. And, uh, and it could be used for leisurely boating or fishing. It even has some speed on it. <coughs> so we asked for that. And it was funny, when I finished the proposal, I told Mike what I had asked for. There were other things too. Oh, I wanted to hire a recreation coordinator. Uh, we never had one. So that was written into the grant as well. So I told Mike and I, I said, yeah, and I included a boat for, and I told him the purpose of that. And he had a big smile on his face. He said, that's great. How about an airplane? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that would, quote, fly <laughs> with Washington. <laughs> so. Long story short, we were successful. Um, somebody told me, somebody, a representative from, from D.C., I think it was, and I don't know why he told me this, but he said they issued 20 grants over across the nation, and I was ranked number 19. No, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm proud of 19. <laughs> Next to last, I made the cut. So that's how we, that's how we got into that. And, uh, so they ended up getting a pontoon boat. Yeah, we had the pontoon boat, yeah. I remember that well. That was exciting adventure, uh, how to, where we got it. Uh, do you remember Tom Tisdale? I do. Yeah, Tom was our purchasing agent for a number of years. And uh, let's see, it was, we didn't have the boat at the time, the pontoon boat, <laughs> or any boat. But uh, we, Michael wanted to look for one, a used one. Good idea. So he and Tom and me got in his little car. He had, what was that car? It looked like it was from Back to the Future, <laughs> one of those places. And uh, so we got in that car and drove. And of course, Tom was about maybe an inch taller than me, and Michael was a little shorter than me, but he was the driver. So those two sat up front, and I was in the back. I had about this much room. So the whole trip I had to sit like this with my legs. <laughs> Got a little cramped up. What the idea was for us to drive along the coast all the way, Lake Coast, <coughs> and stop at marinas that we saw maybe there were boats for sale. So we drove to Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> no kidding. And we spent overnight there and uh, drove back. And uh, we stopped at a few places, didn't see anything that we wanted or could afford. Because I think I wrote in twenty thousand dollars for the for the boat. Don't recall for sure. I think it was that much. Then it was gone from my view. Uh, a few weeks later, before I knew it, a boat was purchased, and it was not a pontoon boat. I don't know what kind of boat you would call it, but it was a very nice boat. A porch porch type boat, yeah. That would be okay. Right, it was very nice, and uh, so I was disappointed, obviously, that it was not. Pontoon, I really figured that would be a really good accessible. But the boat that was purchased was very, very nice. It's a little difficult to get into and not nearly as roomy mm -hmm. as a pontoon boat would be and not really set up for people fishing off the line and so on. But that's, that's how we got the boat and had it for a number of years. Well, I sp I, uh, you, you mentioned the recreation coordinator. And uh, uh, I suspect that that job went to B. Miller. Mm -hmm. How did that, st tell me, I mean, I've told the story from my perspective. How, from your perspective, how did that all play well, out? Well, you know, I was getting the applications. And since I'm a, and still am a nutty Buffalo Bills fan, uh, 
and I had season tickets when L.B. Miller was playing with Jack Kemp. Yeah, yeah, 60s, yeah. <laughs> Goes back a few years. It was in the 60s. And uh, I said, L.B. Miller, my goodness, you know. I was surprised to see the application, and he talked about his background and his app, which, of course, I knew about his professional football back. But he also owned, a, a, apparently, a very nice restaurant and bar in the Hamburg district, which is close to the Buffalo Bills stadium. So we talked, the guy invited him in, he was interested. Didn't really have a background in, in, in working with the disabled or recreation services. So I was disappointed, I thought maybe he had a special interest or something, but he didn't have that. Uh, but he did express an interest in trying it out. And so uh, parted company, and I knew of course that you were uh, major sports fan and, and historical as well. <laughs> so I remember you coming down the hall and I said, oh, I'm gonna let Greg know this. So I told you about it. And you said something to the effect of hire him. <laughs> I'd not have been <laughs> quite as strongly spoken as that. And I said, oh boy, a board member wants me. To... So I mean, I, obviously I would have gone further than that, but I figured, hey, I was interested. Sure. You were very interested, so uh, that's how we wound up hiring him. And worked for a while. <laughs> worked for a while, but he, he would show up late, and it was it was yeah. it was awkward. And Bruce finally had the job, I think, of of telling him thanks, but no. Yes, he did. Yeah. Were you uh, were you on the boat on the time when uh, the the Al captained that pontoon boat with the board members? We were in that journey. Yeah, who, who again? Huh? Al B. Miller was the. Uh, we oh. took the pontoon boat out one time, and yeah. Al was uh, the. Uh, the captain of the ship. We were just going to be. We were going to do a board meeting on the pontoon boat. Yes. Because there was a lot of criticism about the use of the pontoon boat. Well, it was not a pontoon boat. That was one of the. Things. Well, yeah, we the porch boat. Yeah, it was. A, <laughs> however, it was. It was. Uh, people were watching it like a hawk. Like. Yeah. That I, was an extravagance. I think I heard somebody had reported this. Yeah. And uh, to somebody, I don't know. It was a. It was a, a Sunday afternoon venture. And he, he didn't really have our clients on board at the time. <laughs> so that was became a, and so to help count, counter that, yeah. he said, hey, let's have a board meeting. Uh, you know, let's I, use it for uh, that. And uh, Al was going to, uh, well, he was there, he was a captain, you know. Uh, so he started, tried to start up the engine. We, we cast ashore, you know, from down by the uh, 8th Street, you know, where the, the Grand Building sure. was. And off we went, and all of a sudden, they couldn't get the oh, damn motor. So we're just floating, <laughs> heading towards the uh, the viaduct. Oh, and I go, holy crap. And we had, you know, drinks on board, and there was food. and It was a nice spread yeah, yeah. for the board. But uh, all of a sudden, we could just see ourselves explaining, hitting this viaduct. And, and finally, it got turned around. Oh, and it was, it was not a good evening. It was not sure, a good evening. Sure, sure. But yeah, he didn't last much longer. Uh, so you, you, when you came there in 1977, uh, Mike had some people there. Do you remember some of the people who were there? You mentioned Bruce. Were some of the other ones that came? Yeah, Lou Lombardo. Lou? Um, Cindy Philgate. Cindy, Do you yeah. remember her? I do. She was uh, kind of functioning, kind of a combination of clinical director, personnel, sort of a mixed role. But she had been there... I think a few years before I got there, right. and stayed quite a long time, uh, had a very significant part to play in the development, with Michael, of course. Uh, let's see, Cindy, Lou Lombardo, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy Ingram. Uh, I'm not, oh, uh, uh, the workshop director. Don't remember his name, but he was there a few years. <coughs> And uh, McConnell wasn't there yet. Who? Tom McConnell? No, no. He Tom McConnell. He came later. In fact, Tom McConnell replaced the, the director okay. who, who had been there a while but had left. Uh, Tom replaced him and stayed for a long time, yeah. as you know. <coughs> and I think I met, oh, Pamela Murphy. Mm. Was, she died, but she was Pamela Murphy Cleary at, at, after she married, of course. Uh, and that was their children's program. Which, uh, uh, which was a very, very well-run program, served a lot of kids aged three to five. And uh, 
Patsy Dodge, but she came on board. Let's see, I hired her probably about seven years after I started. Uh, and she worked in the workshop as a, no, I hired her as a job placement special because we didn't have one at the time. Yeah, at the time, we didn't, really didn't have a professional, quote, rehabilitation service program. Personal adjustment trainers, <coughs> when I got there, was, there was, the role was designed by the state to work in kind of a quasi-counseling uh, role with the people that were working in the workshop. But when I got there, I found them really doing the work of a workshop supervisor, teaching how to do the job, mm -hmm. supervising people all day. But, but I kind of changed that role for them to be counselors. And uh, that worked out very well. So uh, we, we were able to hire some folks that, uh, that were needed to be trained in an area that, that they were quite unfamiliar with, mainly in the counseling area, but personal adjustment. They did a good job. Uh, so there were some real makeovers in that regard. And job placement then worked with directly with Nancy Ingram in the diagnostic vocational area. <coughs> and it was job placement, not in the workshop, it was job placement in the community. And that was a very, very unusual thing for us to do at mm -hmm. the time. So and then we had several other job placement specialists. Uh, Dick, Dick Kelfus was another name. Mm -hmm. of a guy who was there, stayed for quite a while, worked as jo in job placement. So, yeah, those are the people I can recall. Lou was in charge of, uh, Lou was running the children's program at the time. Mm -hmm. Then Pam Murphy came after, after Lou, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, there was, a, I think, a pretty, pretty good core, core group of folks, uh, you know, lots of skill. And I can't think of a one who was really not dedicated to the mission. And that was... That impressed me a lot. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't often see that in organiz some organizations, anyway. Well, that continues to impress me, the, the number of dedicated folks that, you know, we've talked to, interviewed, and, and how that has continued on and that, how, to, how, to, how that culture has been created. It's yeah, just it's yeah, unusual yeah. effect. I was just noting here that <coughs> Steve's given me some information that in 1977, when you and I both kind of started at this, All right. Uh, there were 19 employees and an annual budget of $800,000. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And I remember shortly thereafter, and it's fun, I'm, I'm so glad to see this number, because I remember when the board adopted its first million-dollar budget. Uh -huh. and John and I looked at it and go, wow, a million dollars. And they're thinking about... That was so monumental at that moment in time uh, that uh, this little organization could have a million dollar budget. And uh, not too many years thereafter, it actually exceeded a hundred million dollars. Uh, Amazing, isn't it? That's what it was when I left, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's incredible. So, Joe, you know, you've done so much, you got awards, I mean, uh, recognitions. But as you reflect back on your years at the Resource Center, is there sort of a, a highlight film, a kind of a couple things where you'd say, this is what I'm most proud of? <coughs> you know, kind of in a personal way? Yeah, know? sure. Kind of things that you feel. Well, you, you know, when, I, when I feel what I, my major contributions, I think, was in grant writing. I brought in a lot of money. And, but more importantly, I brought in some innovative programs. Mm -hmm. Independent Living Center, for one, for sure. And the recreation program, which didn't really exist when they organized, was able to really do a lot there. And the one that almost feel, I've, I might feel better about this than anything, I uh, wrote a grant for a driver education hmm. training program. And this was again with the state, and we were awarded a grant, 50,000 maybe, maybe 70, to, uh, to start a driver ed program for people with disabilities, for adults mm. with disabilities. <laughs> and it went from there. I, didn't know who to hire to do that kind of work. I mean, there were driver educators from the schools who were in Latin, but I needed really somebody who really wanted to work with folks who, adults, who were physically disabled, and some with mild levels of uh, intellectual deficits, uh, and found a supervisor, workshop supervisor, in our Westfield workshop, who was just an energetic, delightful guy who wanted to learn about virtually anything, especially in our field. 
he got his degree in sociology or something. But uh, I got to know him a little bit because one of my jobs was to oversee the Dunkirk workshop under, uh, with uh, Mary Andrews and, of course, the Westfield. So I used to go out to both places every week, <coughs> met this guy. And I said, Jurgen, would you be at all, because of this attitude, would you be at all interested in learning how to become a driving instructor <laughs> for people with disabilities? He got all excited. And I didn't know. He got like, yeah, yeah. So uh, got him and uh, sent him for training in the state somewhere, Rochester, I think it was. <coughs> he became a really fine, very dedicated person. He, he, we had money to buy a van and renovate it um, to accommodate wheelchairs and uh, people with CP who don't have strength in their arms. So you, what you get is a, it's power steering, but it's called sensitive power steering, which means you don't even need the strength to operate a power, a traditional power steering. But um, he, he went for training. We saw him, and he just became a dedicated individual. And in fact, he, when he left the resource center, he, he was asked to operate an agency in the Albany area that was sponsored by the state to run a program there. And, and it was a large program. <laughs> and I think he's still there. <laughs> <coughs> so from a personal standpoint, I felt really proud about that. Uh, in fact, it was confirmed just about six months ago, I was getting a tire repair at Dunn Tire on Fairmont, and there was a little diner in that little plaza. So I went to the little diner to get a cup of coffee and some toast, and in walked a guy named John, won't mention his last name, and he had cerebral palsy. And it was the kind of traditional type with movement, uncontrollable movement, uh, but he could speak quite well. It was there. You could hear it was an impaired speech. And I hadn't seen John in, oh, 20 years or more. He sat down at the counter where I was. He looked over and said, hi, Joe. And he recognized me right away. And we chatted a little bit. But then he said, and this was a killer for me, he said, Joe, I need to tell you the best thing that ever happened to me at the Resource Center. <coughs> and he was there for many years receiving services, was the driver education program. I learned how to drive, and I've been driving now for 15 years, and he pointed to his vehicle out in the parking lot, and I said, wow, that made it all worthwhile. <laughs> so those are, those are some of the things that I kind of cherish in working there, and, uh, and of course, the multitude of other programs I was involved in services, and the people, of course, and the people. And, which includes the, right, uh, many, of the, <coughs> many, many of the people with disabilities that we served. But the, working with, the, over the years, with the very, very interesting folks and pretty much very competent folks. So, uh, you received an uh, Employee of the Year Award, and among the Nominator said, Dr. DiCarlo has been a tireless advocate for individuals with disabilities and his community participation demonstrates his commitment to human services. One of the things I know about you, Joe, you were uh, also involved in the community, so you became a, a representative, wittingly or unwittingly, of the work at the Resource Center in yeah. the community. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're... You're, you became a face yeah. in many instances. Yeah. Served on a number of boards and still am to some extent yeah. in, re <coughs> in retirement. But uh, I was very busy with the community board, with primarily human service agencies, although uh, I've been on the board of the uh, Infinity Performing Arts. Yeah. Uh, offered, uh, I, I started there many, many years ago when it was quite small. Uh, I was on the first board of directors, as a matter of fact. They had an advisory group for a few years, but then uh, created a, an official board. And uh, family services, there were a number of boards. I really enjoyed working with the folks and meeting some people. You know, the, well, you've been a tremendous impact. And in fact, it went <coughs> on to say, you're a visionary and practical, compassionate and creative and that you've enriched countless lives with the commitment to helping all individuals achieve maximum independence. Does that sound like you? 
<laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I love hearing that. Well, it's, it's, it, now it's on tape. Uh, Steve, you've, you've known Joe for a long time. Any questions you have of him? No, I mean, I mean, we had Marie in here, and she was obviously talking about what a mentor you were to her. I've heard Nancy Ingram say the, the yeah. same thing as Joe. So, uh, you were hired after Michael, right? I came on board in 93. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. A child. Is a I, thought it was longer, <laughs> I thought it was longer than that. <laughs> it feels longer than that. <laughs> We had uh, we also interviewed uh, Wayne Hotelling, mm -hmm. in Elaine, the mm -hmm. other day, and that was great. The whole Laurel story, and yeah. which is a, a, a very very, you know, and no, I knew enough of it, but not the deep dark, and having him talk about what it was like to live it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and it's it was very poignant. It was very poignant, mm -hmm. part of it. And uh, but to underscore what Steve said, your name keeps coming up, Joe. Mm -hmm. With all those guys, people, and <laughs> excuse me. Though Marie was perhaps the most intimidated, assuming that you were just checking her out to see if she was one of those people. <laughs> a lady, a young lady shows up and looking, saying, up. "I got a, I got, I was interviewed by Mike Raven, and I've got a job." And you, <laughs> she said, "I'm sure Joe was looking at me askance." <laughs> I still had that picture of her in the hall, looking so bewildered. And yeah. I guess she had just seen Kay as well. Oh. So she was kind of just outside her, Kay's office, and she was just <laughs> lost. But, uh, oh, I'm so glad the way it turned out, though. So is the community. Oh, um, absolutely. She's been dynamite. Yeah, she really is. So what's the, you knew you were coming in today, and uh, was there a, a question you anticipated that I would ask you, Joe, that I haven't? Wow, I think you covered everything I would have thought. In fact, of course, you know, I kind of ask myself a lot now, what's, gonna, what's Greg going to ask me, you know, kind of things like that. And uh, the only thing I was concerned about was maybe I shouldn't be talking about Michael and the personal aspect that we had. And uh, I'm not at all disappointed in what I said or, you know, that type of thing. But, uh, we've, we've touched pretty much all the bases of, of Michael. Okay. And then, uh, you know, professionally, he was a genius. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's my perspective. Oh, I agree with you. A genius, <coughs> right person, right time. I think the, when our history is documented and uh, he, his enthusiasm, his professionalism, his the ways he did what he did, like you and you just articulated, I hadn't thought about it, but he went to the top played with those guys. He didn't go through an intermediary because he no, gets, no, no. gets lost in translation. Mm. And, uh, and that was part of his great success. And yet there was a uh, other side of him personally that uh, I, don't think, I don't think we fully understood, but we all had pieces of it and the community <laughs> reacted to it. Uh, it could be the most outstanding person, uh, gregarious, you know, and then sometimes it never didn't and quite understand. It was understand. perfect timing for a guy like that, ah. too. Because things were just early stages of doing something about thousands of people, mostly adults, who were, quote, living in institutions across the state. And uh, I think the, the Geraldo Rivera's Willowbrook yep. expose was the critical turnaround in that when the parents of the institution filed a class action lawsuit against the New York State Department of Hygiene. And then Geraldo got in there and had a somewhat horrible film that he shows. <coughs> but Michael was, I mean, it was really well timed for him. And the organization was ripe for it too. It was just getting off the ground. A guy by the name of Michael Trowbridge yep. was the executive director for Michael before Michael Raymond. And I knew Michael Trowbridge from, I worked in Buffalo, of course, and he went to Buffalo to take a job with UCPA, I believe. And Michael, from what I had heard, Trowbridge had done a nice job kind of getting things going. There really wasn't much of anything happening at the time. Yeah, right. Mary Andrews was there, and she kind of kicked off some really good things. <coughs> so but Mike Raymond really came in at a, and his style, I think, was made for that time, too, in terms of things were you know, mixed up and not, you know, Really, so well or, organized, I mean, and I mean not just the uh, not just the resource center, but the uh, 
the whole state of affairs because it was so new. Institutionalization, what we called when I was at Gowanda Psychiatric was deinstitutionalization. And at the time I was there, we had over 2,000 inpatients. Mm. And now it's been closed for a number of years, it became a correctional facility. <coughs> but uh, so I think everything gelled, you know, uh, and uh, he was just right for, the, for that job, I believe. Uh, and we went from there. But, uh, well, well he created probably. programs that weren't even on the state's agenda, so I, I suspect he was being asked to advise <coughs> pro programs and saying, oh, by the way, I think if we do X, Y, and Z, and by the way, it'll cost this, and can you give oh, us the money? Oh, absolutely. And things <laughs> happen, man. He was great at getting the money, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was, and again, he went to Albany. Yeah. You know, he, and again, again, he, he did it with respect yeah. to the local reps. But uh, when he wanted to get that program going and that money, he knew where to go, and he did it. And they were very successful at it. <laughs> well, we have a few governors came this way, uh, Kerry yeah, and Cuomo, right. they, Mario Cuomo, yeah. you know, came out here to uh, uh, be, be part of the glow uh -huh, of all uh -huh. that activity. Well, this has been great, Joe. I'm so thrilled yeah. that we, we caught up well, here. I am that you called me. I'm really happy about that. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad so we you, have a good chauffeur. <laughs> you I, said Paul may be coming in then. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah well, I, I suspect he will. Well, he's interesting, too. I don't know if he'll bring it up. But when he, when he came, he was hired as the first director of the day treatment program of our, at the time, brand new day treatment and clinical services. <coughs> and Paul worked for us, I can't remember, two or three years. And he, he and I became pretty good friends. Uh, he had then, he, he, he wanted to take an opportunity to get a position in the UCPA in Buffalo as a residential assistant assistant director to the residential director. And he asked me to write a referral for him, reference him, certainly agreed to. And he said, uh, who shall I send it to? He said, uh, the, the director of the residential services. And I said, and who is this? And he said, uh, her name is Mrs. Tish Brady. And I said, okay, I'll be happy. So I wrote him a really nice letter, dear Mrs. Tish Brady and so on. And so she offered him the position and he got it. So he worked for Mrs. Dish Brady no. until they got married two years later. <laughs> I, I did not know that. All right. me up. That's now in a brain bank. <laughs> but yeah, it was, a, it was a fun experience there. And of course, after he left, we, we became even pretty, I was his best man at his wedding to Mrs. Dish Brady. <laughs> so he could always blame me, right, if, the, yeah. if things didn't work out. <laughs> Well, yeah, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. No givebacks. That's, that's a fascinating piece of the puzzle. Now, you became interim executive director for a short period of time, didn't you? Kind of between the Restivo and... and uh, kind of. Yeah, yeah, I guess that would... Probably by default. Never got called that, but that kind of plugged the gaps here and there, yeah, yeah. you know. But, uh, yeah, Sam came out as the interim yeah. uh, after, after me kind of functioning in that role. Yeah. yeah. And he was there about a year and a half, I think, yeah. like that, yeah. before he hired Michael, uh, Paul. Paul, yeah. Uh, before I let you go, you mentioned Mary Andrews. Talk to me about her. Well, she was, a, she was an innovator, I guess. And, uh, she started out with very, very little in terms of what was offered her by the, by the organization, which is very... From what I understand, I wasn't around, of course, <laughs> but it was really in a very uh, infantile stage of development, mm -hmm. embryonic in a way. And Mary, from what I understand, started a kind of a day service program, and, and I think it was in Jamestown, but I'm not sure of that. Might have been in North County. It was in a, in a church basement or something mm -hmm. or other, and uh, she, she got that thing going, apparently, and that was one of the major seeds in the development of the organization. And she stayed a long, long time and saw a lot of changes. And you know something? You would think that somebody who had started at that kind of beginning, you know, had a lot to do with this place level, would have set up as things change and people came and go and people rose and above her in the org. She, I was theoretically kind of supervisor of her when I started. Never felt 
any resistance from her at all about who's this new guy, he doesn't know, you know, just got along really well. And again, it was collegial more than a supervisor staff relation. Yeah. And uh, it worked out very well. But she was so, I think it was innovative, I guess, as a, and at, at a time where, and I don't care where you were, because I was in Buffalo, and I think I had heard of UCPA at the time. And there was another workshop that was called Niagara Frontier Rehab Center, and they were well developed. But that was about it in, in a big city like Buffalo. But Mary Ann was, Mary, <laughs> excuse me, Mary Andrews was really kind of getting things started here. And I think Mike Trowbridge was the, uh, the next full time director, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But, yeah, she was pretty spectacular. And I've lost touch with her. I have no idea. I know she went, uh, she go? She, oh, she, she just retired, yeah, a few number of years ago. She, she passed, didn't she? She did last year, year before. She what? Passed away. Oh, did she? I was, I had lost track of her. I don't, I don't know. So did I. And then I think I read the obituary, and that was, that oh, was really? the oh. back. Oh, so um, that. There was a Wayne Hotelling Laurel. I mean, that, that was oh, yeah. all connected with their introduction to our place was through Mary. Mm -hmm. In other words, Laurel became a uh, <coughs> an attendee of their, their school. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, wow, lost a lot. A lot of people. A lot of that made a lot of differences. Oh yeah, you go on and on and on. But it's interesting that you've interviewed so many people already, and that I'm sure you've heard a lot of great, great stories. Well, I think it's important to kind of talk about it and get it preserved. You know, yeah. it's important oh, that yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll leave it to a next another generation to sort it all out. But at least, <laughs> at least we'll have it. So I guess uh, this guy is going to be the editor, huh? I, I'm handing it to Steve. I'm not. Do, I'm not. This is, he's, this is uh, Joe. You and I have done our work. We can. No, we can rest easy. No, he's Steve. He'll do it. Do it right. Got to carve out some time to do it. Uh, St Cindy Fieldgate. I kind of lost yeah. track of her. She. Is, do you know anything about her at all? I lost track of her completely. She was. Uh, I think she eventually married Mark. Um, they were partners for many years, and he lived in. I think he lived on the grounds of Chautauqua Institution. <coughs> I'm not sure of that. But not long, after, not long after they were married, and I don't think, you know, Cindy was not with us at the time when she had, she gave birth to twins. Huh? Uh, and I remember coming and visit us once. And I remember Clark Poppleton wanted to chat with her right away because he had just had twins a couple of years before Cindy. So they had a lot to talk about, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I lost track of her. I have no idea where she was. But she was very, very involved with the yeah. Research Center. My impression, even though she may not have had the title of assistant executive director, but she acted uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was certainly close to it as much as Mike would yeah. <coughs> would do that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, had, I got to know her right away in terms of uh, the place, how the place off. Because I didn't spend a heck of a lot of, although I, every when I started, I would go into Kay's office and say, is Paul in? She'd, she'd kind of give me a look like this. It's, I, she'd say, it's only 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'd go in his office and wait for him. And I, for the first two weeks I was there, was, every morning we spent 15 minutes together and talk about what was going on. <coughs> but Cindy, I'd say, <coughs> Spent a lot of time with her because she, at that point, she really knew the insides and, yeah. you know, the agency and the people. Yeah. And that was good for me to, to learn, too, yeah. very early. Uh, you, you know, fond I'm, memories. I'm remembering, Greg, we had talked, I think, earlier with some people about the famous or maybe infamous TRC basketball teams. And I know Joe DiCarlo was a member of <laughs> those, I forgot uh, fine that. athletic yeah, um, talk people. about your team here. Who were oh, some of the members? Well, well, it was me, Lou Lombardo, uh, Mark Morton, Lou, yeah. Steve Tenenbaum, who you probably don't, does that name ring a bell? He was a rehab counselor <coughs> for probably four or five years, and his wife worked for us for a while, who was a social worker. Anyways, Steve, Lou Lombardo, me, Mark Morton, oh, Debbie, Debbie Brown. <coughs> and Debbie, <coughs> I don't know if I remember her, Debbie was... I was, believe it or not, one of the tallest persons on, on the game. And Debbie was almost my height. She, she was really good, too. Uh, 
Oh, and we played the Lady Jayhawks from JCC. Really? Love that, love that playing. Oh, Jim Bonfiglio, too, before your time. Jim was a uh, personal adjustment trainer for me. Uh, yeah, Jim played. Jim became notorious, though, playing basketball for us. With playing, the game we played with the Jayhawks, they were of a well-polished team and uh, nice to look at in many ways. And I'll never forget, Jim is on the court now. I'm, I think I was sitting on the bench at the time. I don't know. <clears throat> and he's playing aggressively you now. And uh, went after the young woman, beautiful blonde woman, dribbling down the, the court. And he went to get the ball from her. Like that, they smashed into each other. And he wound up on top of her. <laughs> they were flat on the floor. And she had a big smile on <laughs> her face. And Jim was terrified. He got off real slowly, <laughs> red as a beet, and he walked to the sidelines. Of course, he never heard the end of it either. Of course. And Lou Lombardo was really very good. And, uh, and I played forward because I was the tallest. Yeah. <laughs> 5'11". But the, we had fun. We played the Post Journal two or three times. And uh, those were fun games. They were kind of... They were tough, though. They were... They weren't, they seemed like they weren't playing for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we had a lot of fun. We played, played Gwanda had a, a, a team. And we had, you know, uniforms too. And I chose, they, we had a choice of our numbers. I chose double zero, uh, <laughs> number of points I expected to score. <laughs> and then the newspaper, you know, wrote small articles about us. And, well, we were all asked to give ourselves nicknames. <laughs> so... I think the Post Journal liked it, but it was a little long. I told them that my nickname uh, has always been Around the Rim and Out. I didn't expect that, because it did show up. Oh my gosh, that is beautiful. So we had a lot of fun with it. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. And uh, Lou brought it up too. Lou brought it up yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, really great, great. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But Michael wouldn't join us. <laughs> Surprising, huh? Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, no, that's yeah. fabulous. So what else, Steve? Any, any, anything else to come to mind? Just popped into my head. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you. And thank you, Steve, for, for acting as the uh, chauffeur here. I mean, that, that, was the, that was the condition. Joe needed the chauffeur and uh, first class treatment. Other than that, he wasn't showing. His oh. agent wouldn't permit him. Yeah, it was great, great to see you again. That was a neat part of it. Yeah. Long time. No, I saw you at Bill Hange's funeral. Yes. That was just a couple of minutes, though. You heard Bill died. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I understand he did a good job. He was a good board member. He's a very good board member. Yeah. yeah. Very good board member. Yeah. Bill and I became good friends. He lives across the street from me. Oh, was that right? So he and his son, Jim, every Thursday morning went to bowl. We went to the Jamestown Lions and we bowled. Yeah. And then went to lunch. That was our routine for like two years. And, uh, I think wasn't it Bill's son who threw up the first pitch of the ball game? I'm sure he has. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know they have a they have a game named after me at, every year at the research center. Oh. A kind of a Greg Peterson night, and yeah. uh, I walk out one of the clients and or employees, and huh. I, I don't pretend to throw out the first pitch anymore. <laughs> I know one thing the board did for me, which I really liked, was uh, when I retired. You had a board meeting at the. The stadium, I can't remember the name of the baseball stadium. Dietrich Park, yeah. Dietrich Park, yeah. We had a board meeting there, and you guys arranged for me to throw the first ball. There we go. I went out there, and I threw out the first ball. And I was 66 years old. Yep. Straight. And I threw a knuckleball. You should have seen the face on the catcher. We were, we were not pitching off the mound. I didn't pitch off the mound. They moved us up off the mound, I don't know, five yards or so, whatever it was. <laughs> and I was the only kid... And on my block, as they used to say, who could throw a knuckleball? No kidding. And I threw a knuckleball, and then I went up, you know, he invited me up to get the ball out of him. And he, he just looked at me, and he smiled and shook his head like that, because he almost couldn't catch it. He had trouble yeah. getting it. Yeah, And wow. I said, at my age, I was able to do this. So that was a thrill for me. Well, you're too. like the Hoyt Wilhelm of uh, baseball. <laughs> yeah, right? Hoyt Wilhelm. He was about 60 when he was throwing. The, there were two pitchers that were brothers. Necro. Yes, Phil and Joe Necro. God, they were knuckleballers. I Absolutely. think both of them, weren't they? Yeah. 
Absolutely. How do you how do you have this history? Useless. It's how useless you, information, Jeff. Oh my word. Useless. Because you're too young to know all these things. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's why we're here. I'm not, <laughs> not feeling so young. Uh, oh. Yeah. This is you know. I'll just. We're, how are you ladies doing? Okay. Are you doing okay? <laughs> they're they're filming us here. Um, this has nothing to do with anything other than it's disability. It's a disability question. Last night. I went to Erie, Pennsylvania, and I, uh, <coughs> there was a birthday party for a former boxing promoter, Don Elbaum. What's the last name? Elbaum, E-L-B-A-U-M, and he's from Erie. And um, he promoted guys, you know, like uh, Ali at some point, wow. Sugar Ray Robinson, Willie Pep, all of those Whoa. Johnny Bizarros from Erie. <laughs> He's one of those characters, got a pug <clears throat> nose. And I got to know him through Jerry Greenstein. Jerry Greenstein was an audiologist. I don't know if he did anything with the Resource oh, Center. I remember his name, sure. Yeah. And he knew I was a kind of a boxing history nut, so he introduced us because Don would occasionally come and visit his cousin Jerry. Yeah. And I interviewed him. And he's just a character. He did everything. Don King. Oh, everybody. Geez. So it was 90th birthday last night. Oh. 90th birthday. So I went down there uh, with my camera, and I was going to film, because inevitably, whoever was going to show up was going to have stories. Oh, sure. And they did. Uh, and uh, this will not be seen generally, this film, so I can say it. But half of the group in the crowd were, had to be the eerie mob. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the slick hair, <laughs> black shirts, you know, the guys sitting and, you know, the tables together. And, you know, it was just right out of some scene from The Sopranos. You saw a lot of sunglasses. Oh, too, my God. That. But anyways, it, it, but some of them told stories. And I'm sure they were a little confused with my camera being there. Like, do I dare say what I want to mm -hmm. say? Mm -hmm. But uh, back to the point is one of the guys in the audience was a guy named Risotto. R A S O T T O, and he was a film producer from, and he had done a film on a baseball player named Dummy Hoy. Dummy Hoy, D U M M Y Hoy. And it was a turn of the, going into the 20th century, so 1890s. Oh, and yeah, okay. he was uh, deaf and dumb, but a very good baseball player. And so at the time, with Cincinnati Reds, and to communicate, baseball is an audio, a lot of audiology, you know, you know, strike one, you know, safe, you know, you're out. Well, those things I just did didn't exist in baseball at the time, but they needed to create something to communicate with dummy Hoy. Oh, my word. So this guy did a documentary on this oh. guy who played for 15 years. And this baseball player. So I'm now interviewing him last night. Great story. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm loving it because it's all related to the extent of, in one sense, you know, developmentally disabled. Didn't use the term then. He he did not have any problems with him being called dummy, uh -huh. deaf and dumb. Sure. You know that was a nickname. Uh, we wouldn't use that now. But it was how we now, when you say strike one, like you you know said strike one yeah. or you're out. Oh, okay. Anything that was demonstrative came because they created what that a system story. for Dummy Hoy. What a tremendous story. And I, I didn't think about it until minutes ago, but this is really kind of connected uh -huh. with adapting to developmental disabilities mm -hmm. in the sports world, no which today we take for granted. An adaptive accommodation is what they call it today. Oh, there's the term. Okay. And that was last night. Ah. I just enjoyed that so much to get that story from him as to how he did that. He worked very closely with the uh, uh, Deaf Association. There's a National Deaf Association. Wow. How, to, how to get that story. Now it's on, uh, you can go on Netflix. And it's, oh, really? Uh, it's called, uh, uh, oh, I'll get it. Um, the Dummy Hoy story. It's called Natural, uh, Silent Natural. A silent a Silent Natural, silent, okay. natural. And he was the film producer. Oh, wow. And he was there because he's doing a story on Don Elbow. Um, you never know. And he knew personally all these boxers you mentioned? Yeah. 
Willie Pep, that goes back to, I was probably 13 years well, old. Well, what he did, he was a young promoter, and Willie Pep was at the end of his career, as was Robinson. And uh, he, uh, you know, these guys needed paydays, because they were broke. You know, but yet they were huge names. Uh -huh. And so then Don Elbaum actually took them and put them on the boxing cards. Mm -hmm. to, and Willie Pepe got three cards. And in many sense, he says, you know, I don't, I'm feeling bad because here you are, three-time, you know, lightweight champion. And yeah. your, your name, anytime you show up, I'm going to pack the place. Yeah. But you're kind of getting beat up, you know. Um, but that was oh. Don, and he... He babysat for Muhammad Ali's children. <laughs> he, That's unreal. He promoted a, a lot of people throughout the world. He's 90 years old, and he, he's about five foot four, pug nose, black hair, you know, wearing black. Got the voice, got the voice, you know, got the voice. Got the voice, too, huh? Oh. And so I, I interviewed him for about 45 minutes last night before some of the other people. Mm. And I was having a hoot. This is just oh, fantastic. So between Joe DiCarlo and Don Elbaum, I've had a good 24 hours. <laughs> I only had one experience with Muhammad Ali, but it was a, fascinating. It was, I was at a convention in D.C., mm -hmm. and I went by myself. And uh, well, the hotels in D.C. are all expensive and pretty nice. Uh, but the resource center was paying for it. Sure, so. expense account, <laughs> yeah. But I was alone. I went down to breakfast in the hotel, very nice little dining area. And there was a table of, that would seat maybe four or five people to my left, just about from here to the stage. And uh, so I'm eating alone, and this group comes walking in. And one of the people is Muhammad Ali. And this is 35 years ago, 40 mm -hmm. years ago. So, no, not 40, but close. And he was still a you know, kind of young man in ways at the time, young for me. And uh, they, they sat down. I'm like, I didn't want to like go over like this and look at him, but I tried to catch him out of the corner of my eye every now and again. But during the, while we were eating, a uh, family walked in with one little boy, he was mighty about seven or eight years old, and I think probably his parents must have told him, because they saw him all over. I think his parents probably told him, this man is a great boxer, he's very famous. So the little kid was impressed apparently. So he immediately went up to Muhammad Ali and started shaking him. <laughs> and while Ali was perfect gentleman with him. I mean, he just played with the kid, you yeah. know. And I was so impressed because he, from what I had read about him, he never really had that kind of reputation mm -hmm. uh, of being so sort of outgoing, warm, and, and he was just wonderful with this little eight-year-old. And, uh, and that kid was with him quite a while. He didn't want to give up, you know. Yeah. So it was a nice experience. And I still think about that. And, uh, and of course, the, we were talking with somebody the other day about last time I saw Muhammad Ali, we were, when he did the Olympic torch. Right. That was just, whew, that was quite a moment. Yeah, it was heavy duty motion. Right? Mm -hmm. Well. We could go on forever here. I talked your ear off. I don't know, it was just occurring to me. Right there. That was, what time is it? Oh, wow. We're going to explain this to Valerie. I they don't know. Served, Good luck, Steve. They serve <laughs> dinner at 5. <laughs> <laughs> they have it scheduled 5 to 6 for dinner, 12 to 1 for lunch, 6.30 to 8.30 for breakfast. I'm not up more. So I usually get there at like 5 after 8, and everybody's gone. They've all gone, including my wife, who's also there, by the way. <laughs> Uh, but I get there, I get to, to eat by myself. <laughs> of course, there aren't many people. There are only, there are only 10 residents in this place. It's a, it's well, if Valerie were, were a right kind of person, she'd go there early, get it, get you a tray, and bring it to you. No, no, she doesn't want to do that. She wants to stay with the, in the kitchen. Oh, nice. <laughs> the kitchen, have it. it's a dining area, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we usually eat at the counter. It's really a neat place. The staff are very, very nice. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, I've been confined too long though, to really appreciate how nice it is there. Because yeah. I was in the nursing home close to 50, 60 days. Oh, golly. And uh, it's just. <laughs> so, so this is where we are now, assisted living. And I talked with my primary care physician a couple of weeks ago, and, and I really came away disappointed. He was not optimistic about my. Because what I want to do, of course, is go home. <laughs> but. Uh, he didn't, didn't really think it was going to work out that way. So you still have the house? 
Yeah, I know. It's just, we haven't done anything with it. It's sitting there in Lakewood, uh, all locked up, a car in the driveway with no license plates because the insurance dropped me. Because right. <laughs> I had this whole thing of the nurse, I was all so sudden. It was not right. expected at all. I certainly didn't expect to be there that long. So, so we're working that out. Steve asked me what was wrong with me. <laughs> well, I spent about an hour and a half telling you all my ailments. <laughs> you look great, Joe. I'm, I'm feeling good. I just, I've lost a lot of weight, but not intentionally. But, but other than and that, I don't feel that. You know, I, I don't walk very strongly. I mean, Steve found that hard too. But uh, in terms of what I feel like, I eat very, very well. Uh, I'm sleeping okay. But it's. It's one of those progressive uh, conditions. Well, the, the respiratory thing is not progressive, but the the blood thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically what I'm really facing right now. So we'll see. But, uh, but I was, it feels like confinement, of course, because in, in a way it is. What are you going to do? Unless when you're in a nursing home. Assisted living is, <laughs> Steve found that right away, out right away. It's not, you don't have a great deal of freedom. You do much more than nursing home. But when, every time I leave to go somewhere, to go out with a friend to, to breakfast, and, or maybe if I have to ask a friend to take me somewhere, which right. happens, I don't like that, but I have to do that a lot. Uh, so Steve came and rang the red doorbell, because <laughs> it was locked. And uh, I showed up instead of one of the workers. But when somebody comes in, they have to sign a, a sheet that says, it gives, you sign your name and where you're, where you're going, right? Yeah, name and where That the person that's picking you up has to do that. And of course, you have to sign out too. Uh, and the person can't come in. Well, right now, I never mentioned this to you. Cuomo lifted, what, 90% of the, of the, of the uh, restrictions, but he did not lift for nursing homes and healthcare facilities. And even though we're not a nursing home, I guess they defined assisted living as a health-related facility. So they're still under nursing home regulations. So if you, you didn't see any staff, I don't think. But they have to wear masks. Mm -hmm. The residents don't have to, but the staff do. Yeah. Even though they're, they've all had their two, uh, two shots, and all the residents have had their two shots, plus the residents I mean, I'm old, but these are people, most of them are older than me, it seems. Uh, and they're all vaccinated, but it doesn't matter. You still have to follow sure. the regs. Uh, they, they all offer much no problem, except I do have a hearing deficit these days. And so wearing a mask makes it <laughs> even a little more difficult to hear people. So every now and again, you see an aide when they're talking to me, they'll <laughs> pull the mask yeah. down. Uh, but, so we'll see where we go from here. Well, I look forward to seeing you in the Lakewood area. But yeah, in the meantime, right. yeah. I really appreciate this, Joe. This has been yeah. great. It's wonderful. Yeah, we haven't walked by your house in a long time. I know. You checked him. Our dog would bark at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your daughter. That's another story. Yeah. Of course, I hadn't seen I, The first time I saw her, you were walking in the building. She was with you, maybe seven or eight years old. And you introduced me, of course. Yeah, yeah. Gorgeous little girl. Yeah, yeah. And then many years later, I don't know if I heard it from you or Cindy, you know, your wife Cindy or some other, but she was eight, 20 maybe, 20, what is she now? Now? Yeah. No, 40. No. Yeah. <laughs> she was seven or eight when I saw her. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I'm terribly shocked because my daughter and I still can't believe it, it just turned 50. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she had a hard time turning 50. Yeah. She was all right with, 30 and 40, but 50. Yeah. My son's 53, and it didn't phase him at all. Yeah. But uh, my daughter, oh, God. So of course, it's, I tease her a lot about that. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 40 years old. 40, yeah. How old, what's her name again? Amy. Amy, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs>